right up front, I use the word vagina, penis, and the word copulation, and the word ejaculation. And those are all perfectly good biological words associated with structures and behaviors that fulfill an absolutely critical biological role. Certainly there are people who might be taken aback a little bit, surprised, but I tell you, once I actually tell people that I study genitalia and that I look at penises and vaginas, I have never had anybody say, oh my gosh, you know, that sounds terrible, or, or be bored for any amount of time. I mean, they all just want to sit there and hear these incredible stories about how animals actually go about the business of having sex. My name is Patty Brennan and I'm an evolutionary biologist. I work at Mount Holyoke College in the Department of Biological Sciences. I'm interested in a, in a wide group of vertebrates, so we have been collecting many animals. The work I do is essentially evolutionary morphology. So I need to be able to describe what the genitalia looks like, right? So dissections of animals and structures. We can actually make molds, then look at the histology, just the basic architecture of the tissue. And then I need to know how they work. So I've been testing the material properties of vaginas, but because they don't function independently, then I also need to know how the genitals function with each other. That means 3D models and essentially use that to predict then what are the structures that are under selection for evolution to actually take place and end up with this incredible diversity of, of genital structures. So yeah, so these are the mako shark. And so the males have these genitals attached to their pelvic fins. And when the males are gonna copulate, they typically use only one of these. So they'll use one clasper. So the clasper will go in the female. And then once the male is inside of the female, he will actually pull down on a muscle and essentially open up the tip of the clasper. The tip of that is called a spur. You'll actually feel it's really, really sharp. And what that's gonna allow him to do is stay attached until he's able to deliver the sperm. Isn't it the most beautiful thing? I think this is just really incredibly cool. Diagrams that I find, there will be like this description of the claspers, but there's nothing at all on the vagina. Essentially, there's very little consideration given to, well, where is this clasper actually going and what is it doing? And so that surprised me. Uh, again, in a good way, because it means that I have an interesting question to go look at. So when we have the females, we can actually make molds of the vagina. Essentially, I use uh, silicone and then I inject the silicone so it flows into all the crevices and all the spaces of the female. We let it cure and then we pull it out. And then that gives us a 3D image of the negative space inside of the vagina. Here we have the mako female and she was a very large female. Then this is the intestine, so from here the intestine will go up that way. So that clasper most likely is coming in from the entrance here of the cloaca and is probably going right through this little notch right here. And then once it gets past that point, then the male pulls out on that clasper muscle to open it up and then dig right in there and just hook itself to the female so that then he can ejaculate and all his sperm will go up inside of the female tract. The sharks have these long spines, spurs, in their claspers, but other animals like snakes, for example, they also have spines. These are timber rattlesnakes. They were uh, run over by cars, and so I got this locally. The three-dimensional shape of the structure for the males hasn't been described, so we'll do that. We're about to inflate the male hemipene so that they get as close as I can to their functional shape. And I'm saying hemipene because like sharks, the snakes have two penises instead of one, right? And they'll use one or the other when they're copulating. Perfect. This is the mold that we just pulled out of the female. We can describe how it's variable. We can look at the differences in the shapes. So these are all different species of snakes. We have a rattlesnake, that's the big one we just did. Then we have a plains garter snake and then a python, and then a yellow rat snake. We know that the vaginas need to be elastic because they're used also for the babies to be born or the eggs to be laid, right? But is there anything above and beyond that that is the result of actual copulation and interacting with those spines? We don't know whether that's the case or not in snakes because it hasn't been looked at, right? And so one of the things that we want to do is then look at the histology 
what those tissues are in the females, but also the thickness and the relative proportion of these tissues in all these different species. It's just, it's beautiful. Look at that one. What we can see here is lots of smooth muscle in the red, and then over here in the blue is lots of connective tissue. Then we can inflate the males inside of the females, and we'll put them in a micro CT scanner, and we can get images of where the male features end up inside of the female. And it's, it's obviously not exactly what happens during copulation, but it's the closest that we're gonna get when we look at these large vertebrates. There's a lot more to discover in the female side of things that's going to really help us understand then the male part of things. I mean, these are these are these have not evolved in a vacuum. They have co-evolved so closely, more closely than any other structure that we can think about. For me, I'm really excited about the process of discovering. And so I do actually tend to seek out areas where there is something that is not well understood or that we don't have all the details. That's what happens sometimes in science. You just gotta follow the questions wherever they take you. And so here I am. <laughs>